Hello there, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Homestead Journey podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. My name is Brian Wells. I'm coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us on the Homestead Journey. This is episode number 11 of the Homestead Journey podcast. Thank you once again for taking time out of your day to join us on the Homestead Journey. I know there's a lot of things you could be doing um, with this time, a lot of podcasts you could be listening to, and so the fact that you're taking time out of your day uh, to join us on the Homestead Journey is greatly appreciated. Uh, First things first, Happy New Year to everyone, Uh, 2020. Hard to believe that it is here, and um, I, you know, a new year, a new decade, all of those kinds of things. Um, But I am, you know, I'm really looking forward to this year. I've, I've been really doing a lot of thought, uh, putting a lot of thought into the goals uh, that I have for this year. Some of the things that we want to uh, try here on Three B Farm and Homestead, and I'm just excited to uh, be sharing that with you. Uh, as we journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This week, we also passed, um, well, it's a big milestone, at least for me, a thousand podcast plays. And so, again, thank you so much uh, for being a part of that. And uh, if you haven't already, if you could jump on over to iTunes or whatever your favorite podcast player is and leave us a review, that will help other people Uh, find the Homestead Journey podcast as well. And then if you could share it with friends and family, people that you think who might be interested in what we have to, uh, what we're discussing here, who might uh, be benefit from from this podcast, I would really uh, appreciate that. And I'm just looking forward to to a great year as we, uh, again, are journeying towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. As we journey into the new year, a few changes that I'm going to make to the podcast, and I really had debated over whether or not I should go ahead and just start season two, episode one, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to continue on season one, episode 11. Um, But I am going to simplify the podcast a little bit, and that is I am going to focus really only on homestead happenings and charting the course. Um, periodically, if something major happens in the homesteading community, then I may do a community corner. Um, And if I have uh, a great homestead hack, I may throw that in there. But, uh, you know, this is a work in process. And so in order to be as efficient as I can, um, I think it's going to be better if I just focus on those two segments. And so this episode will be the first where we pare things right down to just homestead happenings and charting the course. So let's jump right on into this week's homestead happenings. So uh, this week on 3B Farm and Homestead, we almost had a homestead emergency. (laughs) No, it really wasn't. It wasn't. it, It didn't turn out to be that big of a deal, but it could have been. Um, we went down to my in-laws who live about a th- about three and a half hours away for a few days uh, for the new year over over last weekend and uh, you know for Christmas and New Year's just to kind of celebrate spend some time with them and I had uh, care lined up for my animals for Saturday night for Sunday and uh, into Monday and then we were going to come back Monday evening but uh, then the weatherman well he s- was forecasting some nasty weather. Uh, an ice storm, in fact, that was supposed to be coming in and uh, affecting us from Sunday night through Tuesday afternoon. And the the worst part of it was supposed to come right through between uh, my in-laws' house and, and, and us. You know, that corridor of, of I-88 there in the southern tier of New York State was supposed to get the the brunt of this ice. And so I was really left with a bit of a quandary because I'm trying to figure out, do we risk coming home? Um, Do we, do we stay? Uh, The other, I guess, piece to the puzzle is my buddy who was going to be taking care of the animals on Monday morning 
was in Rochester. And so he was going to be coming back through uh, all of this mess as well. And so I wasn't quite sure whether or not they were going to opt to, to spend a couple extra days in Rochester. And then at that point, I was kind of left scrambling. What do I do to make sure my animals um, were taken care of? My dad um, had to work Monday morning, so that wasn't an option. And uh, then when I contacted them, my mom said, really, if it's going to be as bad as they're saying, I really don't want them coming down um, Monday evening, which I totally understood. We're talking almost 15 miles. And, you know, if, if the roads were as treacherous as what they were forecasting, um, the roads between here and my parents are, are hilly and windy. And uh, so I totally understood their hesitancy to, to come do the animals. Um, thankfully, everything worked out. Um, my, my buddy Matt made it back and uh, had was willing to, to take care of the animals Monday evening if we wouldn't have been able to make it back. But the point in my rambling story is that when you have animals on your homestead, it really, really can make life a bit complicated. Not only when you go away, but while you're away, when things like that happen, do you have a good backup plan? And uh, one of the things that I kind of learned from this is uh, that I need to have a few more contingency plans in case something like this happens, where for one reason or another, the, the people that I have caring for my animals aren't able to do it. What is my backup plan? And I really didn't have a good, a good backup plan. So I'm going to be working on that to make sure that in the case of an emergency where, it, you know, if my, my, my friend, and again, it, he's, he's under no obligation to risk his life to come back because he's made a commitment to take care of my animals. Um, I would never expect that from him. Uh, and, and then on, you know, on my part, I'm trying to make a, a rational decision. Do I risk coming home, um, in the middle of an ice storm to make sure that the animals are taken care of, or, you know, do I go to plan a, I guess it would be plan C, <laughs> which I really didn't have. And so I'm going to be working on, uh, making sure that I have other people that I can, I can reach out to in case of an emergency like that. The other uh, major thing that happened here on 3B Farm and Homestead this week is I finally got around to a project that uh, has been hanging over my head since we, well, really before we got pigs. When I put up our paddocks for our pigs, um, I put in a couple of gates with the idea, well, posts for gates, with the idea that I would then hang gates there. Uh, that's something that I never got around to. And in fact, what I ended up using was just some scrap plywood that I screwed to the posts. And when I would need to kind of go through, I would unscrew it and uh, walk through, screw it back when I was done. Um, it, but it, it really wasn't efficient. And um, this week we have vets coming to draw blood from our pigs for the brucellosa survey that's happening here in New York with pastured pigs that we're taking, a part, uh, taking part in. And so I knew that uh, I needed to get some gates that actually swung open and closed, uh, fabricated. I, um, and so that's, that was my weekend project. And once again, <laughs> it just seems like every project I do, it ends up taking me way longer and uh, costing me more money than what I had anticipated. Now, the money piece, uh, it really didn't. Um, I, I bought some... Uh, um, pressure treated two by sixes, a little bit of hardware. Um, the cost wasn't the, the, the major component, but it really took me a lot longer, not so much to build them. The build was the easy part, but really what took me a long time was figuring out how to hang the darn things. Um, this is my first time ever hanging gates. And uh, so it was a bit of a lesson for me. Um, but, uh, eventually was able to get them hung, very happy with them. Although, the one gate that actually is between the two paddocks, I didn't quite get that one the right size, which means that my latch um, doesn't really line up as well as, as it should. It's a little bit too much of a gap, and so I've got to figure something out there. But uh, at least now when the vets come, we will be able to easily move pigs from paddock to paddock um, 
as we need to, hopefully, and uh, and things will um, at least hopefully go a little bit more smoothly because we have gates and not just plywood hanging there. All right, it is now time for charting the course. This is the time of year when uh, many of us, I think, spend a bit of time setting goals. Um, it seems like this time of year, my Facebook feed is filled with all of the uh, New Year, New Me posts. Um, our New Year's resolutions might be to change our spending habits or to, you know, to save more, spend less. Maybe to resolve to eat healthier, be more active, read more, watch less TV. Um, maybe if we work off farm, we've been busy setting goals at work as well. So maybe we've been establishing sales goals, revenue targets, um, efficiency standards, all of those kinds of things. And I think all of those things are good things. And I think as homesteaders, it's a good time of the year where we should be also thinking about our goals for our homesteads for 2020 as well. And so this week, I want to spend some time talking about setting goals for your homestead. And in particular, I want to focus on 10 mistakes you should avoid when setting your goals. Now, uh, admittedly, this, I, I'm sure, is not a comprehensive list of mistakes that one can make with regards to setting goals for their homestead. Um, these are just the ones that came to mind, either ones that I have made myself or ones that I have seen other people make. But if there's a mistake that you've made or you've seen other people make that uh, you'd like to share with others, um, send me an email at the Homestead Journey Podcast at gmail.com or contact me through our Facebook page and uh, I'll add it to the list and uh, maybe we'll talk about it in the future. Now, while these are in certain, certainly in no particular order, um, I'm going to start out by talking about perhaps what I think is the biggest mistake you can make when setting goals. And that is not setting goals. <laughs> Someone once said that failing to plan is planning to fail. And while that might be a bit of an overstatement with regards to homesteading, I do think that if you don't have a plan for your homestead, um, it can result in missed opportunities, it can result in poor decisions, it can result in extra expenses. You know, you're kind of like the rudderless ship, you know, tossed about by the winds and the current. And sure, you might end up somewhere great, or you might end up shipwrecked. Now that that's probably a bit of a, you know an exaggeration but certainly setting goals for your homestead I think helps you be more efficient. It helps you be more intentional. It helps you have greater focus. And ultimately I think if you set your goals properly, it's going to help you avoid burning out because uh, if you don't have goals, if you don't have direction, you're going to be pulled in far too many directions. Now I admittedly have not always done a good job of this. In fact, um, for many years, I, I didn't have any goals for the homestead. Um, I just wasn't as intentional as I should have been in doing the things um, that, that we were doing. I just was kind of jumping at whatever suited my fancy at the time. And as I look back um, at you know the, the 10 plus years that we've been doing this, well, I've learned a lot by trial and error. I think I could have accomplished a lot more if I had been more intentional about things, if I'd set some better goals for our homestead. So number one is not setting goals. Number two is setting too many goals. Um, if I know, and especially I think people who are new to homesteading or you know, kind of like me a couple of years ago when I discovered a name for what we had been doing. It's really, really easy to get very excited and jazzed up about, about living this lifestyle. And we can have great intentions and great goals, but then we try to tackle way too much at one time. And I think that's a sure recipe for disaster. It may overwhelm us financially. It may overwhelm us physically. It may exhaust us emotionally. But trying to do too much at one time, I think is a great way to not be successful at anything. 
But not only that, and this is, I think, where it hits really close for me, is that we can end up losing sight of other important things that we should be doing. As I look around my homestead, there's a never-ending list of things that I should be doing, of things that I need to get done. And if I'm not careful, I can spend so much time thinking about and doing things on the homestead that I neglect spending time with my wife, that I neglect spending time with my son, that I neglect spending time with God, that I neglect spending time with my friends. Um, Homesteading is a great thing. It's a great lifestyle. I love it, but it can't be our only thing. And uh, so we need to be careful that we don't set so many goals that we crowd out all of the other good stuff that we have in our lives. The third mistake I think we can make is not putting enough thought into our goals. Um, Sometimes it's easy to come up with a great list of goals, but we don't consider what it's going to cost to accomplish them or how much time it's going to take to do them. Um, Sometimes we fail to do our due diligence and do research into the the things that we're putting on our, our, our goal list, so to speak. Maybe it's a breed of animal, or it's a gardening method, or it's a homestead hack. We kind of leap before we look. Now, again, this has happened to me. As I shared with you last week, I believe it was, I put in raised beds last year. And now raised beds wasn't anything new to me. Uh, we've had raised beds since the summer after we bought the property here. Uh, but last year I decided to try something different by putting wood chips in the bottom of my new raised beds. Now, if I would have just Googled that, I would have quickly found out that it was a bad idea. But I had seen Justin Rhodes putting the wood in the bottom of his deep uh, raised beds using the, and I I wanna say it's Hugo culture. I'm not not Swedish, so I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But again, the concept is, uh, the the way that they do it is you, you put down wood, build a mound of dirt over it as that that wood rots down it's providing nutrients and warmth to to the soil feeding it warming things up justin did that kind of a modified method in his raised beds and so i wasn't doing raised beds anywhere near as deep but i thought i've got these wood chips they're free throw them in the bottom it's a modified version well if i would have googled that i would have i would have realized that that is a great recipe not to say disaster would be to be an overstatement, but it is certainly a great way to end up with nitrogen deficiencies in your raised beds. And uh, so I would have found out that it's a bad idea. Now, that's obviously a very, very minor example. Uh, eventually, you know, that kind of cleared up and I was able to achieve, achieve a harvest from those raised beds. Not anything like it would have been if I hadn't used wood chips, but uh, it, was, it was a minor thing. But it seems to me that right now, a lot of people in the homesteading community are getting family milk cows. And I'm not trying to kill anybody's dream but I think that you really need to put a lot of thought into that. And if you are somebody that's new to homesteading and you are, have, haven't even raised chickens yet, maybe getting a, a family milk cow isn't necessarily the best thing to do right now. Uh, the level of commitment that it takes, the level of knowledge that it takes, the level of money that it takes. Cows are, they, if they get uh, sick, they can be very expensive to treat. And so, again, I think it's important that you put a lot of thought into these goals before you action them. The fourth mistake I think people make is putting too much thought into their goals, overthinking things. It's kind of that paralysis by analysis. Well, sometimes I can be very impulsive and I don't put as much thought into things as maybe I should. Sometimes I can also overanalyze things. I spend a lot of time obsessing and researching every nuance, you know, trying to get every jot and every tittle correct. And then you either run out of time to execute your plan 
or you're so exhausted at the end of all of that research that you don't execute your plan. And so I think for me, there's, there's that balance that I'm trying to find between putting enough thought into my goals and yet not overthinking my goals to the point to where I kind of get in my own way, so to speak. Mistake number five is adopting someone else's goals. Now, again, this is that time of year when uh, when YouTubers and bloggers and podcasters, people in the homesteading community are sharing their goals for 2020. And in a future episode, I will be sharing our goals for 3B Farm and Homestead. But the danger is that instead of drawing inspiration from other people, we end up drawing imitation. Right? We begin imitating other people. And especially, I think, if you're brand new to homesteading, if you weren't blessed like I was to grow up around this, and you have no, I guess, frame of reference, it's very easy to fall victim to this mistake because you, you don't know any better. And so you see, well, so-and-so is doing this, then, and they're successful, and they're living this homesteading lifestyle, so I need to do this. And, and so it's very easy to fall victim to this mistake of adopting other people's goals. But I think it's important for you to remember that you are on your own journey. And I think it's important to remember the things that are important to you. Keep in mind the things that are of interest to you. Keep in mind the things that are enjoyable to you. If you adopt somebody else's goals, you may find yourself involved in things that you don't enjoy. You may find yourself planning things that you don't really enjoy eating. You may find yourself attempting to do things that you're not ready for. And all of those things are a waste of your time, your effort, and your energy. But more importantly, if you do this too many times, I think you're going to find yourself no longer enjoying homesteading. You're going to find it to be a drudgery. And you're going to end up going back to your old way of living. So mistake number six, keeping up with the Joneses. Now, this is certainly a mistake that we make in many areas of our lives, and obviously not just in homesteading. Uh, several years ago, I got involved in traditional wet shaving. Now, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with that terminology, traditional wet shaving is using straight razors, safety razors, brushes, soaps, those kinds of things in, in shaving. And I discovered that there was this huge online community of guys that had kind of turned what I found to be a drudgery into a hobby that was enjoyable. And so I started collecting old razors and then I started getting brushes and soaps and all of those kinds of things. And I wasn't in the hobby very long and I heard about a particular soap maker that sold a soap that people were raving about. They were raving about its scent. They were raving about its performance. You know, to hear them tell it, it was the best soap ever. But it was very hard to get. They, the, the soap maker rarely had it in stock. And so there was this one time when this vendor announced that he was going to have some more of this soap coming into stock and he announced a date and a time. And as I recall, it was, it was a really odd time. As I recall, it was like maybe nine o'clock at night. And so I uh, made sure to set an alarm and I loaded up the website at about 8.50. And then at about 8.55, I started refreshing the page. And once the soap came available on the page, I ordered it. And as I recall, it sold out in like less than five minutes. And so then for like the next, whatever it was, week or two, I waited with great anticipation for this soap. And when I got it, I was extremely disappointed. Now it wasn't a bad soap. It lathered and it performed like a shaving soap should. But it, well, it certainly wasn't great. And the scent, to be honest with you, it reminded me of a motel bath soap. Now, thankfully, this lesson, 
it, it cost me less than 20 bucks. It was not a, an expensive soap by any stretch of the imagination. But in homesteading, falling into the trap of keeping up with the Joneses can certainly end up costing us a whole ton of money. Animals can be very expensive, obviously buying them as a consideration, but then their housing and their feed and the vet bills, all of that stuff can add up really, really quickly. And so when you are setting your goals for 2020, make sure you're setting these goals because these are things that you want to do, that you need to do, that you um, find enjoyment in doing or that you think that you'll find enjoyment in doing things that you want to explore and they're not things that you're doing because well the Joneses are doing them um, make sure that they fit within your homestead journey don't do it because everybody else is doing it Mistake number seven, setting unrealistic goals. Sometimes we can set goals that are simply unattainable. And folks, I'm not saying this to discourage anybody from their dream. However, the old adage is you've got to walk before you can run. And so maybe let's use this as an example. Maybe you've never butchered an animal before. If that's the case, then you probably shouldn't sign up for a class on charcuterie. That's probably not a good starting point for you. Now maybe if you want to put that on your five-year plan or your 10-year plan or whatever, that's fine. But you're probably going to want to butcher a few animals, a few chickens, a few pigs, whatever, before you jump into charcuterie. Uh, again, I'm not trying to crush anybody's dreams, but I think you've just got to be realistic. And so maybe there's something that you want to do, but you realize, you know what? I've got to raise some pigs for a few years before I get all crazy and learning how to do salami or, or whatever. Um, so make sure that you are not setting unrealistic goals. By the same token, mistake number eight, in my opinion, is setting goals that aren't challenging. So whereas mistake number seven is setting goals that are too challenging, Mistake number eight is setting goals that aren't challenging enough. Now, certainly there's going to be years when you set some really ambitious plans, and then there's going to be certain years where maybe you don't, either don't have the bandwidth financially or time-wise um, to do much more than you're already doing. And that's okay. All right? Remember, folks, this is a journey. Right? Homesteading is a marathon. It is not a sprint. And, and so maybe this year your goals aren't as ambitious as last year. That's fine. But I do think that no matter how far we are down the homesteading path, whether we've been doing this our entire lives or this is our first year doing it, we all have areas where we can learn new skills or improve the skills that we have so that we can be more self-reliant. We all have areas where maybe we can make adjustments so that we are living a life that is more sustainable, or we have systems that we are employing on our homesteads that are more sustainable. We all have areas where we can maybe um, work to become more self-sufficient. And so, I, again, I, I, I just want to challenge us that we should be pushing the boundaries on our homestead, even if it's just a little bit but push the boundaries every year. Maybe it's you're, you're canning and you're canning a lot of stuff, but you don't keep great records when you're canning. So maybe this year, part of my goal this year is to keep better records with regards to how much I can, what I can, so that we know what we use and we know maybe what we should can this year, next year and the year after that, and maybe what we should stop canning. It's kind of the same, regard, same thing with regards to our garden. I haven't really kept as good of records as I should have with regards to the produce that we grow. So should I continue to grow eggplant or should I say forget it? Should I uh, continue to grow, uh, you know, 15 varieties of tomatoes or should I pare it down? I already know the answer to that. I'm going to pare it down. But again, we need to always be challenging ourselves. And so mistake number eight is setting goals that aren't challenging. Mistake number nine failing to adjust our goals. You see, we're going to start out the year by setting goals for our homestead. But I think that we need to keep in mind that things change. 
life happens. And so we need to adjust our goals accordingly. As I shared in last week's podcast, last year I had plans of building a mobile chicken coop and a greenhouse, and neither one of those things got done. Well, why? A big part of the reason was is that we had an emergency bathroom remodel, and that happened when I would have normally been building the chicken coop, working on the greenhouse, and and it really financially and time-wise put me behind the eight ball. And so I had to adjust my goals. And so make sure you do that as well. Um, adjust your goals as you know as as life happens. Um, if you find yourself maybe a little tight financially or maybe something happens and you don't have the time to do stuff, it's okay. Adjust your goals accordingly. Um, if you fail to do that, that's a huge mistake I think you can make. And finally, mistake number 10 that I think people make when setting goals, and that is allowing missed goals to be a demotivator. There's, there's a great likelihood that you are not going to hit all of your goals. Again, last year, we batted 500. Hall of Fame numbers, but you could also look at it as the glass being half empty. I choose to look at it as the glass being half full, but I think that's probably just my personality type. Some people, though, end up feeling like they failed if they don't hit every one of their goals. But folks, again, this is where we need to come back to homesteading being a journey. Sometimes things don't go according to plan. Life happens. Crops fail. Animals die. And sometimes we're not going to get accomplished everything we want to accomplish. But that doesn't mean we're failures. Now, if those goals are still important to you, put them on your list for this year. Right now on my list for this year, the mobile chicken coop and the greenhouse. I shouldn't say they're on the list. They're under consideration to go on the list. Okay? Uh, no, I'm trying to make a determination. Are they still important to me? Do I need to do them this year? Do I want to kick the can down the road and maybe do them next year? Uh, or should I drop them all together? You need to do the same thing. Okay, so if you don't hit all your goals for this year or you didn't hit all your goals for last year, no biggie. Don't allow that to be a demotivator. As long as you're more self-sufficient, self-reliant, and sustainable this year than you were last year, you've not failed. And you know what? Quite frankly, if you're not more self-sufficient, self-reliant, and sustainable this year than you were last year, who cares? It's a new year. It's a new you. Set some new goals, avoiding these mistakes, and continue on with your homesteading journey. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, or even if you haven't enjoyed what you've heard, I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me at the Homestead Journey Podcast at gmail.com or pop on over to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash the Homestead Journey Podcast. And if you haven't already, I'd really appreciate it if you'd leave us a review on your favorite podcasting platform and also share it with other people that you think might enjoy what we're doing and might be encouraged on their homestead journey. Until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.